we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. All right. Welcome back, everybody. We're here with my friend and fellow Texan Senator Phil Graham. Phil, thanks for being on. Oh, thank you very much. So um, I want to read, I want to frame this this discussion for, for the audience a little bit. You know, if you listen to people like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, you would think that income inequality is 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 the number one issue facing America. It's, the, it's worse than it's ever been. It's worse than any other country. And our, our anti-poverty programs just can't keep up. They don't even compare to, to what other nations are doing for, for their citizens. You know, according to this narrative, the average American at the lowest income quintile works two to three jobs just to keep up routinely and during much longer work weeks than those at the top who live leisurely lifestyles. Everything is just backwards according to this narrative. Um, but the thing is, it's uh, as you pointed out in, in your book, it's not really true. While there's definitely situations where Americans fall through the cracks and suffer from extreme poverty, the, the data shows this is pretty rare. Much of what you know about income inequality, poverty, and other measures of economic well-being in America is actually wrong. Biased by government statistics that fail to include at least two-thirds of benefits as income and don't account for differences in federal taxes. So why is that important? Because without properly measuring the problem, we can't lift people out of poverty and create prosperity for the working class Americans, let alone actually devise policies that target the problem. And to the extent that we are not addressing the root causes of poverty, we're also digging our fiscal hole deeper. By the end of the decade, interest on the debt is expected to exceed a trillion dollars, which is money that literally goes up in smoke, doesn't benefit a single person. Today, we're joined by my friend again, and he just wrote a book called The Myth of an American of American Inequality, How Government Biases Policy Debate. So for those of you who don't know, Senator Graham is a legend in the Senate. He's an experienced economist, um, has a, a ton of experience with this particular issue, experienced experience poverty firsthand growing up. We can talk about that. And you know, you're extremely successful. I'll, I'll, I want to give a little bit about your, your bio in the Senate. Um, well, first, before the Senate, you served six years in the U.S. House um, and then 18 years in the Senate. You were chairman of the Banking Committee, author of the Reagan budget in the House, landmark budget, and, and, and banking legislation in the Senate, taught economics at Texas A&M, and you published bunches of, of articles and books, um, and you're senior fellow right now at the American Enterprise Institute. So, hey, thanks for being with us, Senator. It's great to see you been a good friend to me over the years and, and always, always, um, you're also, you, you read a, like a weekly column for the wall street journal. Is it weekly? I don't not. I just, whenever it strikes me, but I write a lot of, them. yeah, I, I'd suggest people, uh, follow your work on the wall street journal. It's just, it's always very succinct. You know how to, maybe this is where Reagan got it from. Maybe you were helping him at the time. I don't uh, know, but like it, it, this, 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 I don't uh, think anybody helped him communicate. Yeah, but he was good at it and you're, you're good at it too. But, but what I mean is getting the right data, the data that matters, you know, a lot, a lot of people just kind of throw out data. They don't think exactly, they don't think through what the story is that this particular data set is telling. And I think throughout this podcast, but you know, the questions we, we have for you here, and, and I'll, I'll quote you sometimes in your book, you have a real knack for for laying that out so that people understand what's happening here. And then here's the data to back it up. All right, well, maybe let's start. I will actually want to start in your early political career, get a little, get a little feel for how, how you got to this point, because you started out as a Democrat, like many Texas Republicans did. Walk us through, I know this has nothing to do with the conversation about what the, the, the you know, inequality and all that, but I think it's super interesting politically how how that movement happened you know this was well before my time in politics you were you started in your, your career in the senate in 84 i was born in 84 so i don't have a good feel for what that world was like um well i knew by the time i was grown that i might think more like a republican than a democrat um i didn't think party mattered it didn't matter to me it didn't matter to people in the district there was no Republican elected official in the district. And uh, I, I was elected as a Democrat. I got to Washington. Uh, and um, I joined a young Republican congressman, David Stockman, in offering a conservative 
fiscally responsible budget in 1979, uh, Jimmy Carter was president. And uh, when Reagan came to town, Stockman became OMB director. Our budget became the nucleus of the Reagan program. And uh, so here I was as a Democrat, the author of the Reagan program in the House. And um, when the, and the Reagan program was passed with 28 Democratic votes, we were, Republicans mm-hmm. were in the minority. What, what do we mean by program? Is it just the, bu- this the budget? This is the First the budget, and then the reconciliation bill that actually made the cuts mm. and mandated the tax cut and allowed the tax cut to pass with a majority vote in the Senate. And uh, so in 1982, we were in a double-dip recession, and um, Republicans lost 30 seats in the House, and the Democrats were back in firm control. They threw me off the budget committee. And so I thought, well, um, the people I represent are being disenfranchised because I disagree with the leadership of the Democrat Party, and Republicans wanted me to change parties, but I felt I was elected as a Democrat. And while everybody knew how conservative I was, Mm -hmm. um, I felt some people might feel that I'd flown a false flag. And so... Uh, I looked at all my options, and I finally came up with the option of resigning my seat and going back home and running again as a Republican. Now, after the fact, it was portrayed as being a real smart political move, but the truth is no Republican had ever gotten more than 35% of the vote in my district. Wow. So at the time— What district was this? So at the time, it was— it was a gutsy move, and it wasn't clear to me that it was going to work. Yeah. But I was ready to take it to judgment, and I figured I could live if I wasn't reelected. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, that I would have to face the voter, and I might as well do it now. And so anyway, I won. I got 53% of the vote against nine Democrats. Wow. And uh, I, I came back as a Republican House member. What, what, what district was this? This was the old 6th Congressional District, okay. which at the time went from Bryan College Station north to the bottom third of Dallas, South Oak Cliff, that area, gotcha. and then the southwest quarter of Fort Worth. Gotcha. And then you're in the Senate. Yeah, the then in the 1984, I ran for the Senate okay. uh, and was elected and served 18 years. Then I turned 60 and started thinking about um, you know, should I quit while I was ahead? Yeah. We had balanced the budget. We had a surplus. We'd won the Cold War. Um, the things I'd set out to do were done. Now, I knew that battles had had to be fought again, and certainly they're being fought again. But so it, it was a chance for me to call it a career, and I did that. Is it accurate to say that from a policy perspective, there was more of a economic consensus back in those days? I mean, the fact that there could be conservative Democrats. Well, uh, it what had happened, we'd had nine years where the average inflation rate had been 9.2%. So wow. the average rate for nine years was higher than the highest rate we had in any month during this inflation. So it was devastating. And uh, the Soviet Union was on the march all over the world. And Americans were losing confidence. Mm-hmm. And so the Reagan election was, a, was a, a, the, a, a movement toward changing the country. Mm-hmm. So there was a, it was an exciting period to be here, uh, but it wasn't easy. I mean, people think, well, my God, you had Reagan. People wanted to do the right thing. Well, it was hard work, and it... It meant compromise everywhere. But well, in the end, compromising is about governing. Yeah. It just seems like back then there wasn't, you know, the, the rhetoric about this, the, the inequality rhetoric, the, 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 the rich paying their fair share rhetoric. It just, it, it doesn't, you know, I, was, I don't really know, but I'm, I'm curious. Was, yeah, it, was, was it not, similar? It was not the issue then it is now. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and the two parties were closer together than they are now. Now they're so far apart that it sort of traumatizes the extreme of both parties. Yeah, I've noticed and the right looks a lot, I, you know, when I look at the populist right, um, it, sometimes it's hard to distinguish their policies from Bernie Sanders. I mean, it's like they have a red jersey on, but beyond that, it's, you know, give people money. Don't spend money anywhere. Just give me the money, right? Because yeah. Americans, real Americans deserve it. Oh, wait, so wait. I mean, are you in Bernie Sanders' party now? I'm confused. You know, it's, yeah. And so it's, it's, our politics has gone many different directions. Um, it's confusing. Well, in the, when I went to the Senate, uh, Senator Byrd from West Virginia, Democrat, chairman of the Appropriations Committee, he and I fought over every budget and every tax cut uh, and many other issues, but we were friends. We worked together. We wrote a highway bill together. Mm -hmm. uh, he never passed an appropriation that he didn't ask me if I needed something. Mm -hmm. It's a different world. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we're now in a period where uh, Democrats are basically socialist. Yeah. And Republicans are trying to figure out what yeah. they are. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's that's the period we're in. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, heck, if, you know, you're going to see that, I think, in this presidential election. I won't say too much about it. But, I mean, it, you're already seeing it where, you know, there's, again, you've got a far right that is that is embracing additional entitlements. Like, it's just completely anti-conservative. I, I don't understand it at all. It's the f first, um, you know, part of that that I saw was um, uh, in the Georgia Georgia Senate elections, um, after, just right after the presidential, when when, when a, your far right populists were, were were constantly saying, "You, you got to give people two thousand dollar checks and uh, universal COVID checks," and I'm like, "Well, why not three thousand? Why not four thousand? Well, yeah, let's just throw our whole limiting principles ideology out the window because who cares? Why not?" I mean, let's just, let's just all be Bernie Sanders. Great well, idea. As I used to say to my colleagues, people won't buy a phony when they can have the real thing. <laughs> if people want more government, they don't want me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll if just, they want just more freedom, they want me. But if they want more government, vote for my opponent. All right, so let's, let's, let's bust some of the, the myths here, I think, on, on inequality. Because I, I do think some of this is interesting. And... Um, I think it help a lot of people just have these conversations when, when they come up because it's, it's unlikely you just have the data and the talking points to, to, to deal with someone who is so sure of the fact that everyone is just suffering, right? And again, I hear from the populist right all the time too, suffering, everyone's suffering. Okay. What, <laughs> first of all, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure exactly what that means. Um, but it, but it definitely paints this picture like, you know, if, 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 if you're not living in a mansion, you are suffering. Everything is, is just absolute hell. So I'm going to quote you on some interesting statistics here. Census now excludes two-thirds of all transfer payments in measuring the income of the recipients of those transfers and fails to count taxes paid as income lost to the taxes that households that paid the taxes. When all income received is counted using readily available government sources and taxes paid are, re are deducted, the ratio of the income of the top 20% of the American household earners to the bottom 20% is 4 to 1, not 16.7 to 1, which is what's shown in the official consensus uh, measures of income distribution. Um, that, that's a really telling set of statistics. So, you know, basically saying, so if you're poor and I'm rich, but I'm paying, you know, and I make $10 and you make $1, but, but I'm paying five dollars in taxes and you're actually gaining another 50 cents in taxes well that's quite a different conversation than just saying well 10 to 1. you know look you can argue that four to one is too much mm -hmm. but it's a very very uh, different debate than 16.7 to 1. the poverty rate fell dramatically from the end of world war ii until 1965 and then we started the war on poverty, and it didn't change for 50 years. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't change because the Census Bureau didn't count for the bottom 20%. 88% of their income comes from government transfer payments. Mm -hmm. When the war on poverty started, 68% 
of the bottom 20% of income earners in America worked. That has now fallen to 36%. So if the objective of the war on poverty was to eliminate want, it succeeded. <laughs> we today, the value of all transfer payments to the average household, the bottom 20% of income earners, is $45,400. So if the objective was to eliminate want, we succeeded, but we did it at a price of idleness. Yeah. And there's still some people that are poor. About 25 to 3% of the population has fallen through the cracks in these programs because they're incapable of taking care of themselves mm -hmm. because of mental illness, drug addiction, or some other problem. And no matter what we spend on food stamps or housing subsidies or, or Medicaid, we're not reaching those people. So say that again, $45,000 is, is basically if you, if you take advantage of all welfare programs, yeah. it's, that's about what that's, you'll Well, make. that's the average of what the payment is. Okay. Now, what percentage they're taking advantage of, we don't, I don't have that data. But the average household in the bottom 20% of income earners in America today receives about $45,400 of transfer payments. Okay. Now, is that, that's not direct cash, but that's like no, it's it's, valuing, say, Medicaid. Yeah, some of the census stamps. counts the cash. Mm -hmm. But, for example, the, you get a debit card that you can take to the grocery store yeah. and buy groceries. They don't count that debit card as income. Right. The government pays your rent. They don't count that payment as income. The government pays your health care bill. They don't count the Medicaid. Since they don't take into account taxes, they don't count the refundable tax credit where you actually get a check from the Treasury. Wow. Okay. If you'll remember, when the president said, if we double the child tax credit, we'll cut child poverty in half. I wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal, you won't, uh, because the census doesn't count refundable tax credits. And sure enough, uh, you it, no didn't, way to measure it, it had no yeah. effect. And so they put out a special report saying, well, if we had counted it, it would have cut it. But yeah. the point is, what we have been doing now for 40 years is we don't count the transfer payments. We've got a large number of people that are registered as poor. We increase transfer payments, and then we don't count them, and so they're still poor. We increase transfer payments. We don't count them. They're still poor. And uh, we need to get our facts straight. And you've all heard the statement that he who writes history determines the future. Well, in the world we live in, statistics write history. Mm. And so... We're having this big debate about income inequality based on numbers that are four times the actual inequality, yeah. a poverty rate that is about one-fifth of the actual poverty rate, and you've all seen the deal about we've got growing income inequality is the biggest problem in America. Bernie Sanders says it's obscene and it's unsustainable. Uh, well, actually, if you count all transfer payments as income to people who got the transfer, if you count taxes, income lost to people who paid the taxes, income inequality is lower today than it was in 1947. Really? Well, let me give you one other number for people who say, well, you know, people are working harder, they have less, things are getting worse, the middle class is is uh, being swept away. 64% of American households today have incomes that would put them in the top 20% 50 years ago. Yeah, a little perspective is healthy yeah. sometimes. It, uh, you know, and look, you forget, in 1965, less than half of all the poverty households in America had full indoor plumbing. Mm-hmm. 20% of all houses in America had air conditioning. 80% of all housing for poor people in America is air conditioning today. 42% of all people that 
are listed as being poor by the Census Bureau own their own home. Really? It's three bedrooms, one and a half baths, a carport or a patio or a garage. T- talk, talk about the household, the measurement as a, of household income. That's a, you know, it may, I think people see that and they just sort of, they just sort of move past it. Okay, household income, you know, and then they just assume that that's the right statistic. But well, it's the... Explain the problems with well, that. Well, what... We used to do it by family, but the Census Bureau changed the number to include everybody that was living in the same housing unit Mm -hmm. as a household. Okay. Uh, And this creates problems because poverty is still done by family. So that, for example, if they're there's a if there are two people living together that aren't married, they both have children, uh they would be getting, by our statistics, double the 45400 because they would be two poverty families. Mm-hmm. So that um, basically uh, this household income figure is a very misleading figure in another way, and that is that household size varies. So that, for example... It used to be 50 years ago. That's where we're in yeah, the house that, and that's right? your bells just, on voting. They, nobody ever knows but what in the hell those any mean. Case, Why was there five? I have no idea. Yeah. I just, did you know? You were here longer than me. Yeah, but I was <laughs> here long enough to go, I forgot. But in any case, uh, the um, we think of poor households as a mom and a bunch of children. Yeah. But that's 50 years old. Yeah. The average poverty household now has 1.9 people in it. Hmm. Uh, the size of households gets bigger as income rises. Yeah. So another stunning discovery of this book is that the bottom 60% of income earners, when you adjust to count all transfer payments and taxes, have very similar incomes. Really? Just across so the board. So you've got people where you've got both husband and the wife working, mm-hmm. and uh, they're both working 40 hours a week. And down the street from them, you've got people, nobody working, and they're just about as well off. Well, I think that's, well, that's, so that's what makes the populist right mad. Yeah, like that's if, if, they, that if they can like the, calm down and articulate what the they mean. That's the economic yeah. driving force behind modern American populism. Yeah. It's the injustice of a system right. where you've got people who are really busting their butt mm-hmm. to get ahead, and they're not much better off than people that aren't breaking right. the Well, there was a study that recently came out where, like, in 27 states, the, the, again, that, that welfare, welfare payment, you total it up, was about equal to the, just the, the mean, I think it was the mean uh, income in the state, <laughs> you know, which is... Yeah, that's going to drive some working people just out out of their minds. Well, one of the things, one of the conclusions of the book, The Myth of American Inequality, is that we the transfer payments are now so big that you're going to destroy the willingness of people to work uh, unless you have a mandatory work. Why, why don't Democrats understand that basic point about human nature? I don't know. And I don't know whether it is they don't care or whether it is they think people just work for the hell of it. Yeah. The yeah. truth <laughs> is that pe- people like you and me work because it's our lives. But for a lot of people, they work to get the things they want. Right. And if you give them the things they want, they don't work. Right. Why would they? <laughs> and uh, it's not complicated. You know, I don't. But maybe it. Unless I'm they want fan. a lot more, but most yeah. of them don't. These aren't these aren't but super you, you productive, know, you, but they, it, innovative people. They don't have the skills to get it by working. Right. And so, one of the things we show in the book is how little gain somebody gets if they don't have any skills yeah. by working relative to drawing all these benefits. So it's hard to blame them. Yeah, you need to blame the system. Yeah, and, and it gets into a kind of a deeper conversation, which is that I don't care what kind of system you have, um, inequality is inevitable because people, by definition, are different. Will work, will work differently. They will, they will, they will put in different amounts of effort. 
They will have different sets of skills, um, abilities, uh, good looks, tall, short. Like and, there's just about and, a million things yeah, that will wanna, always create some sense of inequality. Wanna, there's some people that want to succeed and they work hard. No signer of the Constitution of the United States believe, or the Declaration of Independence either believed that all men were created equal in an economic sense. Yeah. They were talking about equality before the law. Right. But the founders understood that freedom and equality of outcome are uh, more uh, enemies. Yeah, not compatible. Where you've got equality of outcome, you lose freedom. Because you have to destroy freedom to get it. One thing I, I worry about, there's nothing we can do about this because you don't want to hinder innovation and, and ingenuity. But with every new product, with every new amazing innovation that some great American has thought of, where, whether it's Steve Jobs or yeah. Elon Musk or whoever, um, they make life easier. Fundamentally, what they've done is they've made life easier, you know, or, or look at and whatever. And they've become you know. very wealthy in doing it. Well, that, and, but, but the thing is, is by making life easier, it's, 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 it's yet another, so we, we, we've, we've given very concrete examples of things that create dependency, giving you your rent for free without asking you to work in return, giving you your food for free without asking you to work in return. But there's a whole bunch of other things on top of that. I, I, I you know, this is something I think about. I doubt, I doubt your book gets into it. Because it's, who knows how many directions we could take this. But there's so many other things that create that same dependency, right? This expectation, that life, that the, living the good life. Um, younger people believe that they're entitled to far more leisure time than, than my generation was. Um, and let alone my parents and grandparents. Yeah, you were a slacker compared, yeah, compared to grandparents. To, right, it's just, and you know, how far can our society go and... And like what new technologies are going are, are to come out that actually exacerbate that inequality because it creates dependency. And I'm thinking AI. Because now you can just ask AI to write your next book. Yeah, write your next I don't essay. know. Do I'd be interesting to see how it works. Historically, technology has allowed us to do more work, higher quality work, but it hadn't destroyed the need for work. Yeah. And... Uh, I think it's a real question of how happy people are doing nothing. Uh, and yeah. I, I don't, I never see the moral high ground to the left. No. no. Uh, I, they, uh, they want to uh, give people things, but they want people to walk behind them. Mm -hmm. uh, they want, to, they want to, the credit for it and the mm -hmm. reward for it politically. Right. I want to make it's, it's people, transactional. For I want to give people an opportunity to use their God-given talents. Some of them will do better than me. Yeah. Some of them won't. But that's their right. Right. Well, uh, see, as I tell people all the time, like in politics, it's easy. The left has the easiest set of politics. Easy, as, as, uh, they're the populists. I mean, we talk about the populist right. Well, the populist right stole all their tactics from the left. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> populism is just telling people what they want to hear and saying, look, if you vote for me, you'll get this. You'll get this stuff. It's I'll just a, tra it's it a transaction. It's a bribe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, you're bribing people for well, their vote. Well, forgiving student loans. Yeah, it's a total bribe. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's the no, there's never been an election in American history where more money was paid per vote. Yeah. Than in, in forgiving right. guarantees. Yeah, because it's loans. not that now, many people. It, the, the injustice is, of course, is that I paid off my wife's student loans. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think that's of, an unpopular issue for them. A I lot think of, made yeah, a big I don't mistake. think it works either. But for the people, if you're telling people, I'm going to give you $20,000, if I'm reelected, that's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, uh, you there. There got to be people who are affected by that. Oh, there definitely is, and it's uh, it's unseemly to me. But uh, you know, it well, that's worked. the current thing about Social Security and Medicare right now. Uh, the Democrats have been scaring, scaring voters, senior citizen voters, away from Republicans for decades. With this well, it's scare gotten tactics. less and less effective. And look, anybody who doesn't think that there will have to be changes in those programs yeah. as people live longer and longer, as people have fewer babies, as we have more workers per retiree. Yeah. You know, you can't overcome arithmetic even yeah. with A1. Oh, I, I try to tell voters that, uh, but a lot of people so, believe um, other myths. 
I think in the end, honesty works with people. Um, um, I was very, the first Reagan budget eliminated three Social Security benefits. They were add ons, nobody had ever paid for them. Mm -hmm. The adult student benefit, Hmm. uh, the death benefit, the minimum benefit where people could abuse the program by working, say, for the government and then working just a few quarters and get to Social Security. It never hurt me politically because I explained it to people. Yeah. And Social Security was going broke. I was one of the sort of minor authors of the Reagan-O'Neill compromise. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it had to happen or else we were going to have dramatic reductions in Social Security. The key word there is that it was a compromise. And when 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 it's a political compromise, that also means that either side isn't creating false narratives in the media about what's happening and... That's why you're, you're fixing entitlements. It does have to be bipartisan. We're going to have to all be unhappy Oh, with listen, it. we won't reform Social Security until there's a crisis which sort of brings both parties to the foot of the right. cross. Right, that's going to happen. Uh, and that's <laughs> going to happen. Um, well, before I forget, there's one interesting thing, too, I've, I've read in the past, and it's probably in your in your book, but do you, well, do you, do you go into the studies on, on consumption surveys as a way to measure how people are really doing? Because yeah, this whole book's about, like, Let's tell a proper story about what the what life is actually like for the poor, and um, in, in the past I've seen a good way to do that is to act, to actual surveys on like what did you consume this month, like what do you have, like yeah. like you said, like sixty well, percent own their own. One homes. of the one of the things that gave this problem away was a group of economists led by a guy named Bruce Meyer at the University of Chicago looked at what poor people consumed in nineteen eighty. Yeah and then compared it to the consumption of poor people in 2017 and found that by the definition of 1980, only about 2.5% of people were still poor. Wow. And that's exactly the number we found when we counted all the transfer payments. We, the book gets into some other things that are important. Uh, who, are, who are the rich people? Do they pay their taxes? I was going to ask you that. Um, <laughs> I was about to move it there. Uh, and we get we look at that very, very closely. Uh, and the tax system is progressive up to $74 million a year of income. Jeez. Where do all these st- studies come from that say that uh, poor people pay less? Well, first of all, they don't count any transfer payments as income. So they have poor people paying more taxes than they have income. Okay, because they have to According pay. To their own statistics, you own a right? house, you got to pay property taxes. I see. You buy stuff, you're going to pay sales taxes. They don't pay the bottom two quintiles, don't pay income taxes. Um, and then secondly, they don't count income, they count what your income would be if you sold all your assets and took the capital gain every year. Hmm. So, for example, when you saw that ProPublica thing where they stole the tax returns and they were saying that Warren Buffett paid only whatever it was, yeah. well, they weren't, look, they, were, they might have been using what he paid in taxes, but they weren't using his income. They had estimated what his income would be if he sold everything he owned. Oh, yeah. His wealth. And so, hell, that's not a measure of income. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, you start, what happened to the price value of your house this year, your retirement this year? Um, uh, this so would be you, the only honest criticism, I guess, from, from people who are, who are disturbed about massive inequality. is it, Because it is true that wealth builds wealth. And it just compounds and compounds and compounds. And now there's also great risk associated with that. Maybe that's the counter argument. But... You know, do we, get, do we just kind of say, well, yeah, I mean, this is the way it is. Like, what do you, you know, because every time you try to tackle that fact, you do end up creating a world with just less overall yeah. for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I, I would add a couple of things to that. If you look at the richest people in the country, the Forbes 400 list, there's massive turnover. Mm-hmm. That's true. And you've got a lot of people in there that certainly did not start out being rich. Mm-hmm. Secondly, 
mobility is very strong in America, despite all the political rhetoric. Uh, studies consistently show that 53, no, no, I'm sorry, 93 percent of people that grow up in bottom income families end up doing better than their parents as adults. Mm -hmm. And 62 percent of them move up in the quintiles. And compared to the income of their parents, a massive number move up. So you know, if you're going to try to convince me that America is unfair, you're going to get up mighty early in the morning. <laughs> it's better to be born rich and brilliant uh, uh, and uh, beautiful. But people succeed in America every day that are none of those things. Yeah. Um, okay, well, when somebody says to you, well, the rich don't pay their fair share. You know, how does, what, what, what data do you show them that? Yeah, that I got the that? IRS data that shows the tax system is progressive up to $74 million of your annual income. And it, to, it tops out about 41 cents out of every dollar you earn goes to federal, state, and local taxes. Now, is that enough to suit Bernie Sanders? Mm -hmm. No. But most people would probably agree with the statement that you ought to never have to pay government more than a quarter of your income. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and um, the rich of the rich, I mean, they're paying at least, at least half. Again, you know, you talk about rich people. Look at Bill Gates. He's really rich, but he only owns 7% of Microsoft. And who owns the other uh, 93%? Mostly it's owned by pension funds. Uh, 401ks, IRAs, insurance policies, and annuities, uh, and charitable organizations, and we own those things. Yeah. What, what do you think about the, uh, the one problem we have um, with labor force participation? What are we going to do about it? That's a big hindrance to well, productivity. Well, I think you've got to have a mandatory work requirement. And I would also... Given the labor shortage we have, I would try to incentivize older people to continue working. I don't understand why after 75, uh, after somebody's 75 years old, they still got to pay Social Security taxes. Mm -hmm. um, I think above 75, maybe you ought to say, well, the first 50000 you make is tax-free. Uh, because the fact that you're working uh, is helping everybody mm -hmm. and so you've already paid in so your let's social clarify that. security so if you're, if you're still if you're still working at and 75 you're, you're, you're literally drawing social security but also paying into social security yeah. with your paycheck and it's like why you know yeah. I, yeah, and so, so just look, an incentive uh, to keep you've got working. a lot of p and people are living longer they're healthy longer yeah uh and uh a lot of them would choose to work longer if yeah. you would Incentivize. It would be an interesting compromise when we're trying to deal with Social Security yeah. reform, too. I so, think so, we ought to do you it. Know, because cause when you, when you, when the, the truth of the matter is when you're dealing with Social Security reform, it's not left versus right. It's old versus young. So, like, my generation's got to give something, and your generation's got to yeah. give something. And what are you going to give, and what am I going to give? My, my thoughts are, well, if you're super rich, I don't know why you need Social Security, but maybe we let you work tax-free, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but well, for listen. me, it's like, why am I retiring at 69? I shouldn't, I mean, I'm going to live longer. I hope. Well, maybe. I lie <laughs> and tell people I work cause I have a young wife. She wants money and she put me in a cheap nursing home. But the truth is I like working. I, I grew up. The in first a thing can't be untrue. You work <laughs> is so, you know, your work is who you are. Yeah. And I just can't believe people sit around watching television all day. Many of them taking dope. I can't believe they're happy. Yeah. Well, they're not. Uh, they, they, they go online and their video game chats and they complain. I mean, people are seem very unhappy. Uh, this is another question I want to ask you about politics in general, which is it seemed to me people are just angrier um, in general in America. I think it's in, true. in the world. And um, I attribute most of that to, to social media. I don't think the human brain has changed all that much, but like, politics has become more divisive. That's, that's for sure. Um, for a while, I think I blame the left for that, you know, for, for moving further and further from, from very objective policy stances. They've moved further and further left. Um, I'm, not, I'm still not sure the right has changed its policies too much, but it, you know, there's, but it has, it has succeeded in matching the left's yeah. anger and, 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 and therefore unlikability. 
But, I, you know, social media has allowed everybody's anger to just become pervasive and in your face just all the time, and that's not healthy. But, man, I remember, I remember nobody in my middle school or high school knew about political parties or cared. You know, it was yeah. just it was just different, even in college. Well, I always thought anybody in high school that was interested in politics, there was something wrong with them. I, t- <laughs> <laughs> I tell high school kids, I'll say, like, look, I'm like, I'm not saying don't get involved, but I'm saying don't get emotionally involved. Yeah. You know, be okay with not knowing things. Be okay with just taking a slow approach to politics. I hope you choose my side, but if yeah. you do, I want you to come to that conclusion over yeah. the course of I, many look, years. And being angry is is not beneficial in winning people over. That's to the other thing side. I told him because I got I got yelled at when I said that. I didn't get yelled at, but but the but a student said, "How can I not be emotional with everything going on around us?" When Republicans, my, my, the, the, the person told me this, a high school student told me this. Said, he said, my friend tried to kill herself because of Republican policies. And I was just blown away. I was like, that just means someone's lying to her about Republican policies. First of all, that's what that means. You know, um, if you're, you know, and I was like, look, if you're talking about abortion, then it, it's, I want you to listen to what you're saying there. It, it means you wanted to kill yourself because you can't kill a baby in case, I mean, what? So... That kind of narrative building, that well, kind of thing just is, is it's so extreme. And I'm like, look, yeah. you're making my point. The fact that you're upset like this is the problem. You can't just go be a kid. You can't just, yeah. you can't just enjoy your youth yeah. because you've, you've become obsessed with this ideologies that you don't even understand. You don't have the framework. You don't have the experience to really get what's happening here. And that's okay, but it's also, it's okay to be a little bit humble and just take a step back so you don't know. And hopefully you come to my side, but by all means, don't rush to it. Yeah, and do something about it. Don't just be unhappy about it. The uh, Look, there's a lot in America to be unhappy about today. There's a lot to be very happy about. Uh, it's conventional wisdom to run down the country. America's not as great as it ought to be, but it's better than any other place in the history of the world. And uh, I think those of us who understand the system need to defend it. And that, what this book is about, it's about explain, giving people the facts so they can assess their own country. What has happened in the last 50 years? Uh, the income of every ethnic group in America, every racial group in America has grown. Mm-hmm. Uh There's a convergence of college attendance by race. Uh, Virtually anything you can measure other than those areas that are being affected by government policy, labor force participation, uh, has gotten better. Yeah. So maybe we've got the luxury of being angry when 50 years ago you didn't have time to be angry. Well, look what people are angry about. I mean, given what people are angry about yep. oftentimes, yep. it's pretty obvious that these are, these are luxury issues. <laughs> um, you know, when you, when, you, when you don't have to worry about where your next meal is coming from and, you know, how you're going to get clean water, right? We're from Texas. I remember it wasn't that long ago where the, the folks settling Texas didn't know where they were going to get water. <laughs> that's because yeah, exactly. it's hard it's it's not exactly. it's not the easiest thing in the world put you out in the wilderness see how well you do um you know it's it's and, and perspective is important for just calming your mind i mean this is as i get back to when i tell young people i'm like you need to really need to just learn more about history learn more about what your parents and grandparents endured which is which is, wasn't even that much i mean great grandparents now you're really talking but it'll calm you down like right? it's it's it's, it's yeah. the first it's, it's one of the first chapters in my book <laughs> for a reason it'll calm you down and, and make you happier, you know, because it's, it's, it's the, the problem with utopianists, which is effectively what the left has become, because you have to demand rapid change if you're going to get people's attention and get, get elected. And, and, to, and to, to reinforce the, the, the necessity of rapid change, you have to convince them that they're in a crisis. And I think we've just, we've taken that too far. The left has taken it way too far, making people believe that they're in constant crisis, whether it's climate crisis or gender crisis or whatever. But in this case, inequality crisis. Everything's a crisis. It's making people unbelievably unhappy, scared, uh, suicidal. Anxiety rates are, are sky high among young people. 
and and in, in the in the process too, they risk demolishing the foundations that got them to this good point in the first place. They don't even believe they're at a good point. Yeah. Well, and look again, the real as I see it, and maybe if everything's sort of the perspective you begin from, but the great problems facing our country have to do with too much government, too little freedom, too much public debt that ultimately is going to have to be paid. We're going to reach a point in the not-too-distant future where these debts are going to become due. And when they do become due, it's going to be quite painful to deal with it. Can we deal with it? Yes. Is it going to be very unpleasant? Yes. What do you think... uh you sent me this article? I think you wrote it about the corporate, the global corporate tax. Yeah, yeah. I, I did write it. Yeah. Can we talk about that for a second? Yeah, this is a look, Biden, this is what a Biden happened push. is, as you recall, in the last Congress, the Democrats did not um, pass the president's proposed corporate tax increase to have a minimum corporate tax. And so... The administration negotiated with OECD where some 180 countries have now agreed to a corporate minimum tax and have agreed to an enforcement mechanism where if we don't adopt it, then those countries that do adopt it can impose taxes on American companies operating abroad to collect the tax that was not paid in America. In other words, to put the president in a position, say you either raise taxes or foreigners will raise taxes on you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's how can uh, an American president I mean, son, do that? It's, it's I, mean, it's a, I mean, how do you even just, I mean, uh, and, uh, oh, is this going to happen? I mean, how, what, what kind of chances well, are you I don't, seeing here? At this point, a lot depends on what we do. Um, I think, uh, well, we're not going to raise taxes. Yeah, so. we're not going to raise taxes. Um, and I, what I would like to see us do is the following. I would like to see Congress, the House anyway, pass a resolution condemning the agreement and pass legislation to do countervailing taxes on foreign goods for any country that tries to impose mm, taxes good idea. on American Let's Stop it cold. And then finally... Don't provide any funds for the OECD until they repudiate this agreement. Yeah. Why the hell should we be funding right. organizations that are trying to tax our people? I like it. Let's write this bill. And it's this is totally unconstitutional. It's absurd. You know, I mean, it's, it's so it's, it's it's like you've got the a traitor is on our own side to let foreigners tax Americans. Well, no, it's not companies. agreeing. It's encouraging. I mean, he's encouraging uh, yeah. it. Oh, he led the effort. They yeah, I mean, led it's, the effort. It's, it's, it's it beyond insane. It wasn't it's not like he was bullied into on, it. Yeah. They were the catalyst. Yeah. And uh, as uh, the article shows, the great bulk of this tax is going to be paid by American companies. Right, because we have the most multinational companies. Because we got, we've got big companies. It's a great deal got, for every other country. There's a reason you have so many signatories. Yeah. Well, 64, I think the number I recall is 64% will be paid by American companies and something like 14% by Chinese companies. Are the and, Chinese signed on to this deal? Brit- and, uh, and germ, well, no, but that's the way it would be collected. Yeah, and but then, they're not signed on. That's, no. that's, that's interesting. Okay. And then... Um, they put their country first. I, it's good uh, to know. Then uh, it gets down to Germans who were less than 2%. Jesus. This why is criminal. You're, you're ever, right. I mean, why would you ever? This hasn't gotten much that? attention. That's why I wanted to bring it up on well, this because the you sent that me that you article. Agree is that you you like big government wherever it is. I mean, it's but it's this just goes to a whole new level of sickness. Um, we're going to write those bills, Senator. Uh, let's let's do that. If you don't well, go anybody. back and look at that <laughs> article. It's pretty damn discouraging. Yeah. You should, are you? Gonna, yeah. Well, I hope you bring it up while you're here on the hill with uh, with our leadership. It's. I did look at your article. That's why I, I remember it. Um, and uh, God, it just blows me away. I wanted to bring that. Up. We're, we're running out of time. Um, all right. They can get uh, say the book's name again. The myth of American inequality. Cool. Uh, the, yeah, the myth of American inequality. 
It's great for, um, it's just great for anyone trying to make you the argument. You need to read it, and don't be put off by the charts and the tables. If you're trying to convince people everything they know is wrong, <laughs> then you got to give the facts. Yeah. But it's an easy read, I did, and I think it's got a lot of valuable information in it. I think so. Senator, thank you very uh, much. It's great to have you. It's good to see you as always. Well, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>